Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Such a pleasure to be here. So, how many of you know Mr. Wonderful from Shark Tank? Okay, well, so let me tell you a quick story. So, we're at the, at the guitar show, the NAMM show, and he had to go into the restroom, and his wife and daughter were standing outside waiting for him, and just then, some guy comes running out of the restroom and says, that asshole from Shark Tank's in there. And, so, and then his wife says, I know, okay? So, uh, you know, the reason, you, the reason he calls himself Mr. Wonderful is because nobody else will, all right? So, uh, O'Leary is actually a pretty cool guy, but I had a lot of fun doing Shark Tank, and uh, it's a pleasure to be back to my hometown here, Cincinnati, so uh, thank you. Uh, the, Grew up in Mountain Lookout, went to Purcell High School, University of Cincinnati, and it all started, thank you, thank you, uh, 30 years ago, uh, I, I turned my cable TV on, and this was Warner Amex at the time, and I got to channel 30, and that's what I saw, bars on the screen. So, it's sort of a long story, I say to be continued, I'll tell you what happened, but uh, it was so interesting when Jamie called me to tell me about the vibrant curiosity TEDx. She said, do you want to come and hang out in Cincinnati? And I said, well, I said, actually, it all started for me even before the bars on the screen. 1980, I had a company here called the Small Business Center. And this was at 6th and Walnut. I rented a whole office floor. And I was a business broker and a real estate broker. So I sold pizza parlors, restaurants, nightclubs, delicatessens, flower shops. And so once we sold the business, we would help them incorporate the business. We had our leased offices to each individual service component. We had an insurance agency, an advertising agency. It was a one-stop center for small business owners. You came, we sold you the business, we did your books, your records, the insurance, the incorporation, everything you needed to do to be successful. And this is when I said I got into curiosity overload because I had 200 companies for sale. Now imagine this, and this is you know 30 some years ago, I got stacks of businesses for sale, I got the books and records, and I'm, I'm looking at all these different industries, and I get a chance to see what do I want to do? Which, you know, I would sell the business and then it would come back a year later and the owner had cut advertising and the sales were down. And I, this was an amazing thing for me to see all of these different businesses, some succeeding, some failing, but it put my mind and curiosity overload. And it also put me on the road because I had to go to trade shows. I had to go to, if I'm selling flower shops, I have to go to the flower trade shows. If I'm selling a car wash, I got to be in the automotive trade shows, uh, delicatessens, et cetera. So I was doing about 30 trade shows a year going back to the early days, back in the early 80s. So here I was, young entrepreneur, selling businesses, Cincinnati, and I'm at the Philadelphia Home Show. And this guy, he's got a knife in his hand, he's cutting through a Coca-Cola can. And then he says, you think I've dulled that knife? It's still so sharp, I can cut through a muffler. And then he goes through a pair of sneakers, and on and on and on. This guy, his name was Arnold Morris. And when I watched him, he, people were throwing money at him. All of a sudden, he says, and it's the Ginsu knife. And you can buy 10 of them right now today for $14.95, okay? So here I was, this young entrepreneur, and I get talking to Arnold, and I said, Arnold, how long have you been selling this Ginsu knife? And he says, Kevin, he says, I go from here, I'm going to the Iowa State Fair, I go from show to show, 40 shows a year. And that's when the light bulb went off for me, because I said, full of curiosity, I said, wait a minute, there's 30 channels on my cable box. And Channel 30 found out didn't have anything because they didn't have enough programming when they first launched in 1984. So I said, Arnold, I know what we're gonna do. We're gonna take that pitch, I'm gonna turn a camera on, capture it on video, and I'm gonna put it right there on channel 30, and we're gonna see what happens. And that's what we did, and I actually brought a, a, a clip along here of, of the original show with Arnold Moore. So let's just watch this quick now, little clip. you play. take a tomato, the weight of the knife alone cuts that tomato. Let me ask you something. How many knives do you have at home this sharp? You could drop the tomato on top. Pretty sharp, right? You know what one young lady said? <laughs> Can you cut them thin? I said, thin. One tomato will last you all week long. Okay. Arnold Morris was amazing, but this was what was amazing. Warner Amex, and it's now, I guess, Time Warner here, 
they had to offer this local channel, the local entrepreneurs. So for $800, we shot that 30 minute show and then we aired it 30 times. So we had 900 minutes of airtime and a production for $800 and that did $100 million in sales, okay? So, uh, and I, I don't know if there's anybody from Warner Cable here, but I don't think they charge the same anymore, okay? So, uh, but, so my talk tonight is to talk not only about, because there was bars on the screen all over the world, um, in South America, Europe, uh, Latin America, obviously, um, Asia, we went to TVO Tokyo, we went to uh, the, all the, the Sky Channel, Rupert Murdoch in Europe, and my talk today is talking about how we took Arnold public. Now, when I say public, I'm not talking about the Alibaba type public that everybody just saw. Alibaba went public recently, they have a $200 billion market cap, right? So I'm not talking about going public. I mean, there's 28 million small businesses in the US. There's, there's six million new businesses that start every year, but only 300 do an IPO. What I'm talking about is an IPU. And this is where the difference is. IPU is what is the intellectual property of you? Do you have an intellectual property like Arnold did? Arnold was the greatest knife salesman in the world. So we took that pitch, cutting through the can, cutting through sneakers. We took that and took it public. And everybody here has an opportunity to find their IPU, just like when I met Tony Little in 1990. Now, that Speedo doesn't fit him anymore, by the way, okay? So, uh, my, Tony's a good friend of mine and he's a little bit bigger, okay? So, um, Tony Little, I said, Tony, how do you make money? I was selling knives like crazy on TV. And Tony says, Kevin, he says, I'm a bodybuilder, but I am a personal trainer to bodybuilders. And he says, I do target training. I can give a bodybuilder an extra, if he's got one muscle here, I can give him another muscle right there. I can get rid of those love handles, tighten up the glutes. It's target training. So I said, Tony, you do this one-on-one? -on -one? I said, no, we've got to take that public. Let's take it to the masses. What is your IPU, Tony? It was called Target Training DVDs. This, we brought him in the studio, we shot six one-hour DVDs, and we took Tony public with his intellectual property, which was called Target Training. And so, Jack LaLanne, when I said, I saw Jack, I met Jack in 1990. I said, Jack, you're 70-some years old. How do you stay so in shape? He says, Kevin, he says, I work out every day, and I drink fresh carrot juice every morning. And so, that's when the light bulb went off. What is Jack LaLanne's IPU? The juicer. And this went on to become a billion dollar product. There's Forbes Riley on the left. So it was something as simple as taking something he did every morning, drinking juice. He didn't realize that was his intellectual property. That was his IPU and a chance for me to take him public. Now, George Foreman, he loved to eat cheeseburgers, okay? <laughs> and when he stopped boxing, he started gaining a little bit of weight. But his, he said, I want to be able to eat a lot of cheeseburgers, but I got to get that fat to drip off. So he created the slanted Foreman grill. And George is the guy that did this. This was the lean, mean grilling machine. And this was an amazing success. So again, George's IPU was the lean, mean grilling machine. So yes, going public with an IPU isn't that difficult. I say it's three steps. Discover, demonstrate, and dominate. And in the first step in discover, you, you need to find, does, does your idea solve a problem, ease a pain, or improve upon an existing business model? So think about that. Now, I also say test before you invest. So let me show you a quick clip of one I don't want to ask you if, if we followed our own rules of testing before we invest. I got a couple funny clips here. Now you can put on your favorite music and have fun dancing all those extra inches and pounds away. Presenting the one of a kind, low impact, calorie burning, muscle toning, total body exercise that's fun, fast, and easy. The revolutionary new twist sizer from the man who got the whole world twisting, Chubby Checker. Don't do fitness with a man named Chubby, okay? <laughs> All right? No, it didn't work, okay? So, I, I'll show you failures as long as I can show you my successes, okay? So, uh, so yeah, so Chubby did not go public. Let's, let's be honest. That was not a big winner. So, we didn't test before we invest. Today 
if something like that comes to me, I have an internet test site, I get two million buyers, and I get to put that product up against those buyers, and then I get the results back in a ranking of how that product is done against all the other hundreds of products that I've launched. So we now test before we invest. Demonstrate, number two, T's, P's, and C's. And this is all about creating the perfect pitch. Now on Shark Tank, there's 50,000 people that apply to get on the show every year. They only take 300. What happens to the other 49,000 plus people? They just didn't have a perfect pitch. So you want to tease, open with some kind of an attention getting problem. Then you want to please show me the benefits, show me magical transformations, show me some testimonials, consumer testimonials, editorial testimonials. Show me who's using the product. Maybe an editorial, it might be the, the industry publication, the New York Times, whatever. That's the please. And the C's is ask for the order and get that order and, and do it in a quality fashion. And we always say, but wait, there's more. And that's the, that is all, you'll see this in every single commercial. So now, here's one I just have to ask you. Tell me if you think this was a perfect pitch. Kind of show one clip from Shark Tank. So uh, this is called The Perfect Pitch. It was City Kitty. Hi, I'm Rebecca Riscotti, founder of City Kitty. City Kitty is seeking $100,000 for 15% equity in our company. For the 200 million cat owners around the world, cleaning a litter box is a chore that we all dread. Litter boxes are germ breeding grounds. Kitty litter gets tracked everywhere, they stink up our homes, they cost lots of money to continually fill, and they cause fights in otherwise peaceful households because nobody wants to clean this thing. It's disgusting. And cat owners don't know there's any option, but there is. You can toilet train your cat with City Kitty. With City Kitty, the dirty litter box is gone. Your home is cleaner. You're saving money. You're doing good for the environment. And life at home is better for you and your cat. <laughs> oh, my God. This is a cat toilet training system now. It is so amazing that I said yes to Rebecca because her pitch was amazing. Throw away your litter box, save $2,000 in litter, it's healthier, and this little piece of plastic replaces your litter box that goes on top of the toilet, and each week a ring comes out, and week after week, until the ring after four weeks is gone, and the kitty is still jumping on top of the toilet, right? So, I take, I did the City Kitty project. We joint venture the deal, Shark Tank, and now I put it on, we're taking her into going public, right? So I put her on the view, and here I am, Barbara Walters and Whoopi Goldberg, and I, we went on, and it was exciting, and I had sent the product a couple weeks early. I get off the show, and, it, and we gave one to everybody in the audience. They loved it. And then I'm just, I'm getting packed up after the show, and I get a knock on the door. The producer says, Whoopi Goldberg would like to see you in her dressing room. And I'm like, oh, shit, did I do something wrong? I'm like, did I offend Whoopi? So uh, I go down to Whoopi's dressing room. I walk in. She's got 300 pairs of sneakers in her dressing room, by the way. Whoopi's amazing. She's funny. So she says, Kevin, she said, well, it was great having you today. Really loved that uh, City Kitty story you were telling. She says, but I got to tell you, I have a cat named Oliver. And when you sent that product here a couple weeks ago, I tried it. So I took Oliver. I threw the litter box away. I took her into the bathroom and I showed her the City Kitty. Oliver took one look at City Kitty, ran into my bed, in my bedroom, jumped on top of the bed, crapped all over my bed. Okay. I said, thank you for not saying that on the air, whoopee, okay? So it doesn't work for everybody, but you get your money back if it doesn't, okay? So, all right. So City Kitty, yes, it went public. We took it massively public, millions and millions and millions of dollars all over the country, uh, Walgreens end caps, the, the uh, many trade shows, the home show. We took her to not only The View, but the Good Morning America, the Today Show, the Wall Street Journal, et cetera. So, so going public is about multicasting. It's not just using TV, you use radio, you use internet, and the last step, you have to dominate. Discover, demonstrate, and dominate. How do you take the idea to empire? And that's one way, the old way I used to do it was I gave guys like Rupert Murdoch you know, a lot of money because it was a few channels broadcasting to millions. That's the old way. 
And let's just talk about the history of radio and TV. When you, when you think about it, it took radio 38 years to get to 50 million people, to television only 13 years, the internet four years, iPod three, Facebook two. But here's a guy that got to a billion people in six months, okay? The same, the sigh, how about that? Now, how did he do it? He used millions of channels to broadcast to a few. And that is what going public is all about. It's finding your intellectual property, you, the IP, you, and then taking it to millions of channels, utilizing many of these YouTube stars are doing it right with an iPhone and putting it up on the web. And they're becoming YouTube celebrities with millions of followers and big money. So new media is what it's all about. And just, I think, to close, I'd just like to say, love being here, but I think I don't know how many of you out there think you can go public. It's, it's a great way to, to take your product, and market it, or your service. And any time that I ever have a question or a doubt, I make one phone call. I call my buddy, Tony Little. And I asked Tony, I said, Tony, yes or no, do you think this new idea that I have, do you think I can take it public? And this is usually what he says. You can do it. All right, so thank you guys. I really appreciate it.